I am coming to your house to steal that background, sir. No, you can't have it. No, I want it. <laughs> that was created for me by, by a, an old friend of mine. That is amazing. Uh, yeah, it's just sort of uh, likenesses of all six oh. makeup designs. I, I, I always think that Eric Carr makeup doesn't get enough love. No, it doesn't. Anyway. I thought it was the Vinnie Vincent one, really, but, there, but that's because Vinnie was a bit of a knob. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> really? Not a Kiss fan, so I have no idea what's going on. I was going to say, right Tom, I have no idea what's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, probably best that you do. Probably best that you don't know Tom, in fairness. Yeah, that's fair enough. Reason to Live, I think it's the only song I've ever. Oh, no, obviously I've heard all the classics. Yeah, okay, but... well, that's the okay. 80s Kiss, okay. Yeah, so, and uh, is it I Want to Rock and Roll All Night? Is that another one? Yeah, yeah, well, that's yeah. The, the Rock two and Roll for... National Anthem. Yes, two it is. for two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I might just stay there. I don't. I don't want to get too carried away. Yeah, that's, I'd, I'd leave it at that. <laughs> I, was in, I was impressed you knew Reason to Live. To be fair, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, how are you? Ian? Yes, I'm grand, thank you. Yes, very good, very good. You guys okay? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm full of cold, so if I start coughing, just ignore me. It's fine. Mm-hmm. It's fine. You can't catch it over the internet. No, I was <laughs> fully expected to be like, it's not COVID. Because <laughs> that seems to be everyone's go-to these days. <laughs> yeah, it does to be fair. Wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this, by the way. This means the absolute world. Uh, what we normally do is I do a little intro and then we just throw questions at you. Anything you wanted to ask? Anything before we get started? Or no, we um, it? Um, nothing's off limits. Whatever you want to talk about, it's fine by me. Wonderful. Beautiful. Dear listeners, today's guest is one of those beautiful surprises you find when you stumble across, and boy, am I glad I did. I had an idea to talk to someone in a tribute band, so I decided to go about finding one, and in doing so, I found today's guest. Today's guest has not only been in tribute bands, he's a musician, obviously, releasing two solo albums, he's a radio host, a passionate football fan, and most importantly, like myself, he's a brummie. For American listeners, that's someone from Birmingham. Joining us today is the incredibly talented Barmy Brummy himself. It's Mr. Ian Danter. Hello, hello. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jamie. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here, sir. Especially when I was going through your resume, I was like, ah, oh, no, this yeah. should be a great conversation. Yeah, not all of it stands up in court, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, examination, uh, examination, I might struggle, but. Um, no, yeah, well, yeah, it's it's a um, it's a been a pretty full life, I suppose you could say so far. Yeah, it's good. It's it's incredible. But I mean, how has the last year been for you? The killer question. Well, when lockdown first hit uh, in March, um, obviously everything completely shut down from my work point of view um, because sport shut down, and I'm, at the moment my main role is a football commentator. So what I did was, after a couple of weeks of wondering, you know, what the flip, I decided to revisit um, an old radio show that I used to do on BRMB radio in Birmingham. Jamie will know that well. Um, I had a show called The Barmy Brummies, which was a drive time show, which was all sketches and parody songs, uh, characters, things like that, utilising my voices and my musical talents. And basically, just above me here, I've got all the mini discs with every sketch and parody song I ever came up with. So I had the means to transfer those mini discs into my computer. So I thought, right, let's let's do a nostalgia podcast, see if anybody in Birmingham remembers this nonsense. So I started the Barmy Old podcast. Um, and within six or seven weeks, we were, Sean and Andy, my old writing partners, came back on board and said, right, let's write some new stuff. So by the by the time we got to the end of the first series, which was like 26 episodes, rather than it being an archive podcast of old stuff, it was 90% new stuff. Amazing. That's incredible. So cool. What a way to utilise the time. Well, it, 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 filled a, it filled a gap, you know, once we got to sort of late June, early July, when Project Restart began, and I actually started to, you know, working again uh, in you know uh, empty stadia doing uh, commentaries then time started to become a little bit more difficult to devote to it so i will get back to doing some more bar me podcasts but um that was basically how i got through the lockdown 
Excellent. I mean, but how weird was it to go back to stadiums with no fans? <laughs> it's always been weird. Uh, it, 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 you know, it doesn't get any less weird with every game that you do. The first one I did was Brighton against Arsenal uh, when the Premier League came back. Yeah. And of course, you you know, you get to the ground, there's all the rigmarole of getting through the, the, the temperature checks and as well as the bag searches, you can't leave your seat unless you go into the toilet. If you go to the toilet, you have to clean up after yourself, you know, properly and, you know, sanitise where you've been. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that didn't get any less weird with whatever ground I went to, whether it was Premier League or a Championship Club or a League One or a League Two. The protocols were there everywhere I went. And, you know, the, the requirement to, you know, stick to the rules. So... You know, you knew you were in a privileged position where fans would love to be, and that just heightened the responsibility of doing a good job as a commentator. Yeah, because you know you got people listening to you, thinking, "I wish I was there with him," but I'm not. So take me there. So yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you get that increased responsibility of, of more listeners who who want that um, picture painted for them. Absolutely. I, just because, I mean, I used to be obsessed with football back in the day. I'm not so much now. Then again, funnily enough, I'm actually Scottish. I know the accent gives it away. Um, so, <laughs> so the SPL is obviously where I, it's not what I normally watch. And, you know, the level in Scotland's not what it's like. And it, I mean, English Premier League football is probably the pinnacle now. I mean, it's probably the top dollar, the top dog, where everybody wants to play and where it wants to be. So, I mean, for watching Scottish football with no fans, just felt like I was watching a normal game anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm, half Scottish. I'm half Scottish myself. My um, my mum's from uh, Grangemouth. Oh uh, wow! So my Scottish team, because of my uncle Jimmy, is Falkirk, and Falkirk have had an absolutely dreadful time of it uh, down in Scottish League One. Now we were for a time we were that classic, much like my first love, Birmingham City. We Falkirk flitted between the Premier League and the Championship, and then they went down to to League One. So it's not been good for the Bairns in the last few seasons. No, I do want to go there one day. I've never I've never seen a Falkirk home game, so I'd love to get to the Falkirk Stadium sometime and and take in match. I mean, do you always stick to the Premier League Championship? So no, no. I, I, I'm I, this this season in particular. Um, has been mostly championship for me, but there's been a you know a fair amount of uh, League One and and League Two. I was just this past weekend at Forest Green I'd, in League Two. I'd never been there before. It's it's a ground in Nailsworth in in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire, um, and it was an extraordinary game against Newport for the right to go to Wembley for the playoff final. Um, so yeah, you get to go all around the country. So you 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 go to a you know a Premier League ground where everything's you know depending on the ground you go to, some Premier League grounds are better than others, but generally the, the, the standard of the facilities and uh, your workspace and everything is just perfect. Yeah. And then you go down the leagues and everything's a bit more tight and compact and, <laughs> and you, you just have to make the best of it. But you don't get any less of a welcome uh, or any less of a friend, a friendly face to greet you when you get to some of these stadium in the championship and League One, League Two. So, just it's great for, you know, for knowledge and broadening the horizons and everything, you know. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, man. Cool. Just when you were talking about, and I'm going back a little bit there, when you talk about BRMB, that mm -hmm. jingle instantly came back to my head. I swear that will haunt me forever, that jingle. 96.4 FM, BRMB. I could go it go off in my head because that was the tram uh, clips that would set people's cars off to the, the travel bullets in was coming. That did, <laughs> and the end of every travel bulletin. So, um, Just wake up in a cold sweat when I did. Like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was that was my first job. For those that don't know, my first job at BRB when I started working there was the flying eye um, travel guy. I was the guy up in the plane, fifteen hundred feet above Brum, doing the travel news. Um, so you'd you'd get up at half four, five o'clock in the morning get to Birmingham airport to the cargo entrance, not the, the main passenger entrance, but the cargo entrance uh, on the Cobb road. And you go up in a twin engine Seneca uh, plane 
with a pilot. You'd sit next to the pilot. He'd be on the right. You'd be on the left. And that was it. That was your morning. Sometimes you had uh, guests come up with you, you know, um, people that advertise with the station or prize winners or something like that who want a trip to go up in the, the flying eye. And many of them were sick as dogs. Pack <laughs> <laughs> it. Um, I can just I can just imagine that you're like, there's a lot of traffic on the M6, and looking in the back goes. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much the long and the short of it. Some because what happened was if you came across a, a major accident, what you had to do once you got permission from air traffic control, you could circle that accident. So let's say it was at I don't know junction ten of the M6 or something, you would circle that for as long as it took for you to you know get all the information you needed and where the delays and checking all the escape routes and what was happening so doing that if you're not used to being in a plane that would send them all oh they'd get all bilious <laughs> amazing yeah. well you've done a lot of cool things over the years you know as tom was saying we were going for your resume it's like jesus christ this is incredible but what was the original career plan for young master danta what was the first thing you really wanted to sink your teeth into rockstar rockstar love it rockstar um and that would have been i don't know from the age of 10 or 11 um i was listening to rock music before then courtesy of my two older brothers but once i heard kiss alive which was an album i borrowed off my cousin who lived just around the corner from us um that first side of music those first five songs on kiss alive juice strutter got to choose hotter than hell firehouse that 12 15 minutes of music totally changed my life Beautiful. and changed my idea of what i thought i would like to be because the the excitement that that album generated in me made me want to be a rock star. I was already playing piano by this point because my dad was a brilliant <coughs> guy. So I, I started taking piano lessons at the age of eight or nine. And I was okay. I was going through my grades and stuff. But once I heard Kiss, I knew I wanted to be a, a rock star. And I didn't equate piano playing with being a rock star. I felt I had to go another route. And I ended up with the drums when I was about 11. Um, I didn't get a proper kit until I was 14. So it was a bit of a wait to get the, the proper drum kit. But yeah, uh, that's all it ever was, Jamie. From the age of 10 or 11, I had delusions of, of grandeur. <laughs> and that persisted probably for the next 20 years. <laughs> that's amazing. You, you're absolutely right, though, about that first side of Kiss Alive. It's... A lot of the diehard Kiss fans say that though, because a lot of, that was how they discovered Kiss, because those first three albums weren't the biggest of sellers, were they? So, no, and, and it, it was released over here. Kiss Alive was because it belonged to my cousin, right? Don, who you know, he had one or two Kiss albums in his collection. I'd just gone around to his house because my brothers, who had Thin Lizzy and Deep Purple and Rainbow albums, which were great as well, I loved them, but they didn't like their horrible little brother listening to the same music they were. So, that sod off and going on something you like. So I'd gone round to my cousin's house to see what he had in his collection, what I could borrow. And Kiss Alive was one of the first things I I stumbled across. So it just so happened it was Kiss. It could have been another band that I spotted just flicking through, but, you know, um, it just happened it was that great cover. But I would urge any, anybody who likes rock music just to try that first side of Kiss Alive because I was so in love with it at the time. I didn't play sides two, three, and four for weeks from <laughs> absolute sheer terror that the rest of the album wasn't going to be as good as those first five songs. <laughs> I was just playing side, side one, side one all the time. And eventually I plucked up the courage to flip the first disc over to side two and play Nothing to Lose and, you know, Come on and Love Me, Parasite and She. In a way, you know, I thought, oh, this is brilliant too. And then you listen to side three and there's the drum solo on 100,000 years and Paul Stanley interacting with the crowd in 1975 and getting people to stand up at a gig. People didn't stand up at gigs in those days, but he's making them stand up. This is nuts. 
Is that what happened at rock concerts in America? And it, so, yeah, I was completely sold on Kiss by that point, and I spent the next year or two or three just amassing whatever Kiss release I could get my hands on. By that time, um, it would have been sort of 79, 78, 79. So I managed to get everything up to Dynasty and um, Unmasked, which was the 1980 album. Yeah. The first album I actually remember buying brand new when I knew that the record was out and it had a release date, ended up being the concept album that they did. Music Ooh, the Kiss. Elder. Yeah, which was, a it, for those, well, you wouldn't know this, Tom, but it, it was the first Kiss album that didn't have Kiss on the cover. It was just a, a hand reaching up to a, a, a door knocker on a big wooden door. It's meant to be a big concept piece that Kiss decided they needed to do to please the critics. Um, so that was the first album I bought on the day of its release. And that was a tester, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not the best start, is it? <laughs> like a 13-year-old kid who's, you know, listened to rock and roll all night and Detroit Rock City, and you're suddenly being presented with orchestras and... <laughs> You know, I'm just a boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paul Stanley singing falsetto. This is this is a tough gig. But yeah, you know, I, I stuck with him. So yeah, going back to your original point, yeah, it was just all about wanting to be a rock star. So playing the drums came out of that desire to, you know, follow that path and that delusion, if you will. That's amazing. I mean, I wouldn't call it a delusion as such, because when I was growing up, I wanted to be a musician as well. But I mean, I came into music, my dad introduced me to like Nirvana, Nine Inch Nails, like Metallica, that sort of era. Yeah. Um, and that's what I grew up on. And I always wanted to be a rock star too. Um, I tried my hand at bass and at singing, not very well. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was what it was at the end of the day. Uh, I had a bit of a laugh, so. Well, you, know, you, you, you find your path in the end. I mean, I found a like-minded soul at school in uh, Andy, who was pretty much the only other person in the whole West Midlands who'd heard of Kiss in my age group, never mind liked them. Um, but it just so happened that he loved them as much as I did. Uh, and he was a bass player. So um, we decided we were gonna form a band before we left school. And eventually we found a guitar player, uh, Keith Laurent, who's still my best mate to this day um in the mid 80s and we started a band a three piece um and we were ambitious right from the off we andy was designing stage sets you know that we would soon be playing on you know with we called ourselves minotaur and we had this idea that uh, the drums would be set up on on the, the minotaur would be the back of the stage and the drums would be set up on the fists of the minotaur it's it amazing up, and they would levitate at, you know, <laughs> Absolutely po faced balls. But <laughs> we wrote original songs. We didn't just do covers. We, we thought, you know, we're going to write original songs straight away. But of course, you know, we're, 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 we're just kids. So, um, and we'd never had a singer in the three years that we were together, just drums, guitar, and bass. I ended up having to do all the, the singing, which isn't a good look on stage, really. We never had a front man to, um, to make us look good. But that was the start of it, you know. The start of writing songs and having that desire to get better as a musician and a songwriter kind of all in one really it must be so difficult to sing and drum at the same time i had to learn again it was kind of like the pat head rub stomach thing oh <laughs> at the time my drumming was you know so so because i'd only really been playing with, with the kit for two years or so. I wasn't a virtuoso by any stretch. Um, but yeah, I had to, basically what I had to do was I had to um, get my personal stereo, my SciShow personal cassette stereo thing from Dixon's, whatever it is I'd got for Christmas. I had to sellotape it to my head. So <laughs> that's not where I thought that story was going. <laughs> so the headphones wouldn't fall off because I'd be drumming along to the Kiss album, Lick It Up, and singing along to it whilst I was trying to master the technique of singing and drumming at the same time. I got there in the end and it's been very useful to me 
down the years. Um, but maybe if I hadn't bothered, then we might have found a decent front man and things might have been different. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic way to learn, though. I love that. I took the coving off the, you know, you, you've got that sort of coving on top of your walls. Oh, yeah. Uh, my drumming was so loud, I removed the coving. It was like coming loose <laughs> from, the, from the walls in my, my, my bedroom at my mum and dad's old house, which didn't go down well. But um, Imagine not, no. And that's why it, it, we ended up getting a, a, a youth club to go and rehearse in, which was in a fairly remote place just outside Solly Hall, so we could make as much noise as we liked and we weren't going to disturb anybody. When I moved into this house, I had a nightmare removing the coven from the ceiling. If I'd known all I had to do was get a drum kit and just play as loud as fucking possible, there that would have made my life so much easier. There you go. It's, you know, <laughs> there's a proper life hack for you. That's an amazing <laughs> hack. I love that. No, you mentioned my little, I was looking and like all the different bands you've been in. There's some, there's some incredible names and I'm not even joking that I like, Shotgun Wedding is an yeah. incredible name for a band. Absolutely love that. And City Kids, Son of Gods, all amazing names, but all to different levels of success. Were you close to making it big with any of those? Because also I saw you told the Tiger Tales at one point. Yes, we did. That was um, the City Kids slash Sons of God band, which came later. Shotgun Wedding um, was a band I joined in the late 80s. Uh, as just as drummer and it was a five piece and there was a time when Sony were interested in the band uh, Muff Winwood, who was a fairly well known uh, producer related to Steve Winwood, of course of Traffic and Spencer Davis Group um, his record company showed some interest in Shotgun Wedding but it never came to anything um, so we never really got that far up the the rock and roll ladder um, although we had a lot of fun trying, but Sons of God, which is what City Kids became, I, that Tiger Tales tour you're talking about, um, that was 1994. Um, we'd met City Kids in our Shotgun Wedding days and we'd become pally with them. And uh, after Shotgun Wedding had unfortunately bitten the dust, City Kids called me to say, we need a drummer. Can you come out on tour with us? So I did a tour with Tiger Tales going around the country. That was my first ever experience as a proper, you know, touring musician sleeping in the back of the transit van on top of my hardware case that I just put in there, you know, and trying to get comfortable by rearranging the duvet under you so you felt like you got something soft to sleep on. <laughs> uh, so, and that band got signed to a, a, a local independent label. But again, things never really, um, never really progressed we never got that much um, recognition, but that wasn't for me. wasn't a really good band with really good songs, um, and I was a good. I felt I was a good songwriter by that point, and I felt well, I've got, I've got some work to do with these because I thought they were even better songwriters than I was. So that raised my game in a sense. Have you still got any like old demos or anything like that from these bands? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. Um, Sons of God actually released an album, a posthumous album, years and years after the fact. It was called We Were Never Really Here. Um, <laughs> probably struggled to find it. It went on Amazon, I think. But it was just like most, most of our demos and stuff that we'd done um, over time. Shotgun Wedding never released anything um, officially. But yes, if you, you might find a copy of Sons of God, We Were Never Really Here somewhere floating about in the ether. <laughs> I've tried to track that down. I mean, you did a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, you, I know you didn't well, quite make it how you wanted to, but obviously you had your own bands and you played a lot of tribute bands as well. But just playing music generally, I imagine, was probably just the most amazing feeling ever, playing in front of people, you know, oh, regardless. Yeah, I mean, you know, with it, when you're playing original music, then that's, of course, the most worthwhile thing because that's something that you've created from, yeah. from scratch. Um, and of course, when that doesn't work out for you, uh, and you end up playing in covers bands or tribute bands, as I did, then you derive a, a different kind of satisfaction from playing. It then becomes about the accuracy mm. of recreating what people want to see. So the first tribute band I 
played with was a Bon Jovi tribute in Birmingham called New Jersey, um, featuring a couple of former members of Shotgun Wedding, uh, who were obviously still mates of mine. And yeah, the, it, you know, everyone was looking at the John and the Richie, right? No one knew <laughs> what the bass player, keyboard player, or drummer looked like. My job was to play those parts accurately, you know, because if the drummer's not playing the parts right in a tribute band, you know, the right fills, the right accents, chances are the bass player's not going to do it either. And then the guitar player and then, you know, keyboard player, it's not, it, it, the responsibility on the drummer is paramount to, you know, keep everybody else in line. Mm. So you learn that pretty quickly when you get into tribute bands because people notice when you're doing it the way they want to hear it, they appreciate it and they tell you so. And they also tell you when they don't think you Because <laughs> Bon Jovi's got a lot of bangers. They've got a load of bangers. We, we, I mean, it, of course, it didn't hurt uh, as, a, as a single man at that time that there were a lot of um, ladies that came to watch uh, Bon Jovi tributes. Um, so I must admit that didn't hurt. We did a gig in, in this in Norfolk once. And um, <coughs> one of the big songs of the night was always, you know, the ballad. Oh, oh yeah. I love that song so much. <laughs> and um, we were playing that and there were two girls right at the front by the stage who were on uh, the guitarist side, uh, Dave, who was the Richie Sambora or Itchy Sombrero, as we probably called him. <laughs> Itchy Sombrero. <laughs> and as he goes into the guitar solo, do, 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 you know, that, that's a very heartfelt. And these two girls start, start bawling their eyes out. Absolute, just because he's, I mean, we were joking, oh, you, you must have cocked it up, Dave. But no, it, <laughs> we knew he was playing, you know, bang on. And it just so happened, because we spoke to these two girls afterwards, and it just so happened it was their favourite song, it was their favourite guitar solo. It's just the moment in time that mattered that much to them. And so they just started blarting whilst we're playing that song, which Incredible. as you're sat behind the drum kit looking across at them is a little disconcerting, I must tell you. <laughs> but, but that's the level of, of, of how much these people invest in the bands and the songs that they love. And that's why you've got to get it right. Love that. I, I never really thought that much into it when it comes to tribute. That's a really good point. Because, you know, these songs mean a lot to people. So you're du duplicating not only the songs that mean to them, but the performance of that song. It, yeah, I, that's a really good point, actually. When you get onto the, the Kiss thing, um, you know, I started a Kiss tribute in 2003, but then was asked to join Dress to Kill, the longest running Kiss tribute in the world, a couple of years later, and I jumped at that chance. Uh, because they were, you know, one of the biggest tribute acts in the country. Then you get to a whole, whole new level of accuracy. You've got to have the right looking instruments to play with, right? Mm. Guitar player's got to have a, a, a Cherry Sunburst Les Paul. Paul Stanley's got to have a like a, an Iceman Ibanez guitar. You know, bass player's got to have a black Spectre. I've got to have a black drum kit, you know, with a KISS logo on the front head. We've got to have the right costumes. We wore the 1977 Love Gun era costumes. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the right makeup, of course, you know, that, and you spend... So you get to a show, typically, like, four o'clock in the afternoon to sound check. The four of us would set up. We'd have somebody, one other guy with us, who would set up the, the pyros that we'd use. So we'd sound check, and then we'd have to go straight to the dressing room and get into makeup and costume because it took us two hours and during that two hours the support band would put their gear on stage in front of ours do their set come off and then once we're ready you know makeup wig boots whatever in place we go on we play a 22 23 song set running all eras of kisses music um and then end of the gig we go out and meet people they want their photos taken, of course, with someone that looks like they're in Kiss. They'd always want to take a photo. Um, and then you go backstage, you scrape the makeup off, you come back out, you break your equipment down, load it back into the van and off you go. It's a long old day. Wow. <laughs> it 
it's like you say, especially with like a Kiss one as well. It's not just the sound, the look, and it. It's an act. You've got it like Ash. Is it Ash that plays Paul Stanley? Yeah, Ash, 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 Ash bore the brunt of it because he's the front man. He's yeah, Stanley. And um, there was one show where we we done the, the gig and it was a roaring success. I can't think of any drastic kill gig that wasn't you know a really really great night. We never had any duff nights. There were always Kiss fans just absolutely lapping it up, licking it up, you might say. Hey. <laughs> we went out into the audience to uh, thank people and have photos. And um, I was chatting with some guy and then I could hear this bloke come up to Ash, who was stood behind me and go, oh, brilliant, brilliant big mate, brilliant big, but just, um, just one thing. And Ash went, oh, right, did we miss out a favorite song of yours? Went, oh, no, 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 set list was, set list was amazing, man. I stole your love, oh. No, no. And so I said, oh, was, I know the pyro didn't go off like it should have done at the start of Love Gun. No, that's not, that's, don't worry about it, mate. Pyros were immense. And I said, well, what was the problem then? He said, well, you haven't, you haven't got quite as much chest hair as the real Paul Stanley, do you? <laughs> Ta-da! You know, and so how, how on earth do you, you know, what, so he's got to go and buy an Austin Powers, you know, <laughs> Chest rug just to keep you happy. I mean, you know, there, there's no pleasing some people. That's got to be the weirdest criticism I think I've ever heard, ever. Yeah. My country mile. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I originally emailed you, did we not discover that I was at your first Dress to Kill concert? Yes, you were. Yeah. The, Kiss, the Kiss Expo in Nottingham, yes. 2000. My first show with Dress to Kill was the, it wasn't annual, but it happened quite often, an expo, Kiss Expo. So, you know, uh, uh, Kiss merchandise guys would come with their wares to sell and there'd be other bands playing. This was at the Rescue Rooms in, in Nottingham, which was yep. just around the corner from Rock City. Um, and uh, we were, you know, headlining for my first show with the band. And the special guest of honour was uh, Eric Singer, who was Kiss's drummer in the 90s uh, for like, you know, the Revenge Tour. And at that point, I don't think, was he in the band? He might have been just got back into the band. I think, I think he was just before he got back in. Maybe, maybe he'd just been fired and there were contract wrangles anyway. Um, he agreed to play four songs with Dress to Kill on my drum kit mm. as part of the show. So he came, we sound checked early in the morning that day before the doors opened. And he came over from the hotel and he was actually quite agreeable and friendly, you know, and I had to sit behind my kit and just doom, 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 had a little tap around. He goes, yeah, that's fine. Honestly, he said, yeah, that's fine. And this is important because of what happened later. He then, uh, he was then, once the doors opened and people were letting, he came back and he was in, in a room where people were coming in to have things signed. And evidently that took a long time. And, uh, when it came to the point in the show where he was coming on to play his four songs, don't think he was in the best of moods. Ooh. He was a bit crabby from, you know, <coughs> all these autographs. and what, I don't know, but whatever it was, he had a hair across it, right? He wasn't happy. So he came and sat behind. So I moved out of the way and moved off stage. He sat behind my drums, complained for about five minutes, that it wasn't how he wanted it, even though it was exactly the same as it had been at Soundcheck. Eventually, he acquiesced and says, right, I'll do these songs. And he proceeded to smash seven shades of shit out of my drum kit over the next 15 minutes. Just brutal, um, particularly my cymbals, to the extent that when, I, when he'd had enough and he'd done his four songs and disappear without so much as a, a thanks or a buy your leave, just skulk straight off stage, never to be seen again. It took me three minutes to readjust all my cymbal stands because everything was mangled to buggery. Um, and my uh, drum skins were pitted, you know, where he'd been hitting them so hard. Yeah. Um, and this was a really, it wasn't just a cheapo drum kit. It was a Pearl, he was a Pearl in C, and this was a Pearl Masters custom he was playing on. And he just thrashed the shit out of it. And I thought, there's no need. I mean, my ass was going 50 pence, five pence. Standing 
<laughs> That's a saying. I like that. Give her the true colour of it, something like that tactic. Um, but yeah, so you did see my first uh, performance with with Dress to Kill Jamie, and, and I played with him for five years. After that, not just around the UK, but we played places in Europe too, Norway and um, Spain. We even did some gigs on the Orkney Islands. We even took a ferry right from it's amazing from uh, the north. Uh, first, so took a ferry up to um, Kirkwall, I think it was, um, it, on the Orkney Islands to play a show up there. Such was the demand for us. That means then I have your first ever show on DVD. Ah, now wait a minute, is that the one with Bruce Kulick? No, this is the Eric Single one. Oh, that's it then. That's yeah. the one. That is my first show. So I'm pretty sure I'm trying. I think we played the Oath that night. I'd, I'd, I'd have to check the track listing, but. I'm pretty sure we uh, played some rare. You did. You played it second. It's got the track listing on the back. <laughs> there you go. So we played things like the oath, and uh, when you played an expo with Dress to Kill, you really had to dig out loads of rarity. When you played a, a standard show, you uh, Gary, our bass player, used to talk about the dirty dozen, the twelve songs you kind of have to play. Yeah. This tribute band, like Rock and Roll All Night, like Detroit Rock City, uh, like um, oh, Cold Gin, things like that. But then when you look at that, that track listing you've got there, Jamie, from that uh, expo, you'll find at least half of those are unusual. Yeah, it's like amazing. Parasites on there, like they very rarely ever play that now. Well, that's, the, that's one of the ones that Eric played, Parasite. Um, the things like Escape from the Island, I think we played, it was an instrumental off the Elder, just some bizarre stuff we played that night. But the diehards loved it. It was great. I, I absolutely loved it. I, I had a T-shirt, but I think all the... The things that were on it fell off over the years, so it ended up. Yeah. Oil watch, they see that's always a always a risk. <laughs> but you actually beautifully went into my next question, then really, because I've often wondered with tribute bands, like how do you decide what songs you're going to play? Is the is it like let's just play the hits, or is it a case of I like this one, let's do this one? What will happen is Gary, uh, the bass player, was in charge really of the the, the set list because what he. What he had, he had an inventory of the set list we played at certain venues every time we've been there. So let's take a couple of venue, um, like the Walthamstow Royal Standard in London that we used to play regularly. He had every set list that we'd done there down the years. So he knew what we should stick in there so as to avoid repetition. So if we were going to play something unusual, it wasn't going to be the same unusual song two shows in a row. So if we played, oh, I don't know, put something out of it. Like if we played Danger of Creatures of the Night there, we wouldn't play it again there the next time. We'd pick something like, you know, something off Crazy Nights or something interesting. So as I mentioned, there was those 12 or 13 songs that you always put in, but it's what you mixed it up with that made it interesting. So what a couple of weeks before each run of shows we did, Gary would send the set list through to us all. And of course we we'd tease him and send him replies, oh we're not playing that, are we? <laughs> because we didn't mean it. Um, because we knew that he was diligent enough to know what uh, worked last time. And you know he he'd learned how to balance a set really well, in my opinion, so that it made it easy for me. And of course, these were all songs that, because we're all Kiss nerds, the four of us, we knew them, you know, backwards, and, you know, all ways to Sunday. So we didn't rehearse very often as a band, probably once a year, if we were working on something that was particularly obscure. The rehearsals came at soundcheck, really. Right, are we doing um, I've Had Enough? Yeah, okay. We, you know, there was one show where we, so I went into the um, intro to I've Had Enough of Animalize. They all joined in. We played the song straight through without any mistakes. And Gary said, right, let's drop War Machine. Let's put that in instead. So we played, uh, that was the, the Diamond in Sutton in Ashfield. So just by pissing about at, at Soundcheck, we added another song to the set. That, That's that, amazing. That was really good, you know. That is amazing, especially because Animalize as well. That's that's not a slow album. That is an, <laughs> those songs are a challenge. Kiss were playing much quicker. Their live shows, I think they wanted more energy. They, they told Eric Carr 
to play with more tempo uh, during the 80s. They, they calmed it down once they got to the late 80s, early 90s. But yeah, so a song like I've Had Enough was a, well, it's a challenge in itself, but in the midst of a, another 22, 23 songs that you're playing, these were pretty punishing shows. Remember, I've got makeup on uh, and, you know, lights everywhere. Uh, I'm not a professional drummer. I'm semi-professional, you know. So it, it, it took, took its toll if you weren't at least relatively fit and ready for it. Did you ever plug, so take your headphones back on and do backing vocals or anything like that at all? <laughs> I had to go out front and sing Beth, which was the big Peter Chris mm. ballad from Kiss. So I actually wrote, uh, it was a song with, uh, you won't know this right, Tom, but there was a, it was a song with orchestras on it and it, it was a very heartfelt love song that Peter Chris had on Destroyer, which was a big album for Kiss. So he, he used to, Peter Chris used to sing it to a backing tape with the real band every night. So I did it as well. So I, I wrote the backing track, composed it at home, um, and I sang to that pretty much every show. Came out from behind the drums, threw roses out into the crowd like Peter Chris used oh. to. Um, made sure I took the thorns off first. Uh, <laughs> and that was an, another part of the accuracy, another part of the desire to be just like the real thing. Just, that so, sounds so amazing. I mean, I know, again, going back, you said that, you know, we were gutted that you didn't get signed, but that just sounds wonderful. I know it's dedication to one band, but it just sounds like you had so much fun, you know, nailing it night after night after night. It just, with Pyro, you know, you fully kitted out. Like, you know, I'm a little bit jealous. I would love to do something like that, just a tribute to whoever and done it properly. Just what? sounds like you had a wonderful time. I, I have played with a few um, tribute bands, down the years, I mentioned the Bon Jovi one. I um, I guested, I helped out an Aerosmith tribute called Toxic oh. with a few gigs when they needed a, a drummer. Um, I played for some years in Birmingham in one of the funniest bands ever. Ian the Goat sings Black Sabbath, which was kind of a parody Black Sabbath tribute. Ian the Goat was a, a stand-up comic and big Sabbath fan that I knew. Big burly guy. One of the funniest guys I've ever met. And Stu Clark, who was a guitar player, worked with me at Musical Exchanges, the guitar shop I used to work in. And he was a tiny little thing, but what a player. And then concocted this idea of a pantomime Black Sabbath show centered around the fact how much Ozzy Osbourne and Tony Iommi hated each other. So <laughs> we have a pantomime Sabbath show where Ozzy would come on with his, you know, white tassel shirt on, you know, and he gets sacked after two numbers for ruining... <laughs> Tony Iommi's So I, and you know, it was just, I, I, I could bore you with it, Brad. One of the funniest things I've ever done. Um, you know, but the dress to kill thing, obviously, given my love of, of the band, the love, my love of Kiss, that was particularly important to me to get the accuracy right. To me, you know, never mind the audience, mm. to be accurate. I wanted to do Peter Chris, Eric Carr, Eric Singer the three drummers of Kiss, Justice, and tried to play the shows as kind of an amalgam of their three styles, if you like. Before we move on for this, do you still have the costume? Yeah, it's in the loft. Uh, it's been washed, just in case. Um, it is there, um, ready, in case um, anything was ever <laughs> thrown my way. Because Dress to Kill are still going. They are still... Mm longest running Kiss tribute in the world, uh, but most of them are based up in the Northwest now. But, um, oh yeah, if the call ever came, I'd uh, I'd put the old clown white back on again, no problem. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so we need to talk about your radio work. So it was around the time of Son of God that you got into radio, wasn't it? Sons of God had just kind of fizzled out. So how did that come about again into radio? That was all about... Um, my friend Keith Laurent, who I mentioned earlier, who was in my first band with me, he'd written a letter to the uh, head of sport at BRMB saying, my mate Ian does the best Trevor Francis impression you've ever heard. You should get him on the radio. <laughs> and Tom Ross, who was the head of BRMB sport, read this letter and thought there was something in it. 
So he rang me at the guitar shop I worked at and asked me to write a sketch for the Saturday afternoon football show that they did, you know, prior to a live commentary of either Aston Villa or Birmingham City or West Bromwich Albion, whoever it may be. And so I did that for a few months. And to cut a long story short, that was a few months later was when I got offered the chance to do that flying eye job that I mentioned before mm. in the plane. And from that, what grew out of that was a chance to do on-air shifts as a presenter on the, the AM station, Extra AM as it was known, but um, it, was also, it became known as Capital Gold. Um, and within two years of, of, of going up in the plane to do my first um, travel bulletin, um, I was the drive time presenter doing what was called the Barmy Brummies. It was a pretty rapid change, you know, in my life. I'd given up the, the, the career I had working in the music industry. I've been working as a guitar salesman and I'd become a guitar distributor, distributing guitars to retail shops, but I'd given all that up. Um, and it was a bit of a risk at the age of what, what would I have been? 29, nearly 30 to do this handbrake turn career wise. I mean, you know, I'm still here. Um, so it, it's not gone that bad, but you know, it was, it was a risky step to take because I could have been dreadful. And I probably yeah. was in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> too hard for yourself here. Too, too hard. But what I'm saying is obviously because it, you obviously, they drastically push you through within two years, you must have thought that you found your calling. I think the confidence grew within me once, funnily enough, once I was put on overnights because I'd been doing the, 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 the travel stuff, you know, Monday to Friday. And um, I tried a few cover shifts here and there. And the boss said, I need to hear more of your comedy, more of your voices. You're not doing enough. And he was right, you know. So he said, I'm putting you on Saturday into Sunday overnights, midnight till six. Carte blanche, do what you want. Bring in who you want. Just make it funny. So I contacted at that point my friend Steve Beebe, who to this day is still a writer on Kerrang! magazine. Uh, and I'd got to know him in the shotgun wedding days and he'd become a really good friend. And he came on board with me um, and was my sidekick. Uh, and we started doing stuff during the night. And we used to have these things called... Um, snoop sessions where and these were the bane of radio presenters existence you would take a cassette take it into the, the studio where you were doing your program you put the cassette into the machine that was there and you'd switch it on to record and pause right so it's on like on standby yeah every time you open the mic fader to say something the cassette would go to record and play when you'd finished and you pull the mic fader down the cassette would spool around for a couple of seconds and then go back to record and pause, meaning it would record every link that you did in that show and would cut out all the music. You could then give that to your program controller and he would listen to that either the next day or the day after, and he would more than likely get you into the office to critique you on it. And these were brutal things, Snoop sessions, you know, because you'd sit there and you'd hear the first link and I think, well, that's okay. And he'd stop the tape and go, what was, what'd you do that for? Uh, um, what do you mean? So, and, and you know, that the, it was all about trying to make you the best person you could be. But as I say, it was tough love. But through that overnight show, my confidence, as you mentioned about, you know, confidence, my confidence grew about doing comedy and, and, and you know, just generally being on the radio and doing the things you're meant to do, housekeeping and, and you know, making it sound slick and, and well produced and tight. And that's why the drive time thing came along, because I learned pretty quickly what worked and what didn't for me. And it seemed to hit home with the, the audience. And next thing you know, I'm doing drive time. It's amazing. Does that mean that you found out that you could do the voices that you could do the impressions during the overnights oh no i knew i could do them it was just finding a context in which they worked you know um finding situations in which you could make a billy Connolly or a trevor francis or a, a william Hague work in in a 
you know, what sort of situation, how do you set these things up? And it was also important. You learned about word economy, actually, in those days, more than anything else about. There's the great saying of Joe Perry and Aerosmith about songwriting. He said, don't bore us, get to the chorus. <laughs> I like that. Nice. Oh. When it comes to sketch writing and, you know, comedy stuff, that kind of also applies the idea of get to the punchline <coughs> and then get out. Don't out, don't let a joke outstay its welcome or a situation hmm. outstay its welcome. So you learn very early on the idea of keeping sketches reasonably short so that they had more effect that way. That was just all part of the confidence growing within me uh, and Steve too. But when the Barmy Brummies came along, Steve didn't fancy a career in radio working five days a week. He went back to his writing and his uh, journalist in things. So the Barmy Brummies was a different group. Me and two brilliant stand-up comics and writers, uh, Sean and Andy, and um, they were amazing. And they, they were the Barmy Brummies team for those two years that we did drive. Incredible. You like as you just said, you know, you've done various different slots of the day, various different things. But and a lot of hosts, they sort of have their thing, you know, what they're known for. But you've done all sorts, like I say, comedy sketches, commentary. Was this you wanting to try different things, or was this the people at the radio going, Ian, you fucking smashed it, mate. Now let's try this. Well, um, Let's see. With BRMB, it was all about the comedy and, and it was all about, you know, sketches and songs and the characters we created. Um, when it came to, and I did the same on um, Heart FM because I left BRMB eventually uh, and I did a similar show, a weekly show rather than a daily show on Heart FM in the Midlands around the mid 2000s. But TalkSport came along because I was doing football work for BRMB and Capital Gold. They wrote me in as a reporter at first and then I became a commentator. So I I was developing my football work, my broadcasting as a, as a commentator alongside what I was doing with the Barmy Brummies. So I was working six days a week. So you do five days a week, Barmy Brummies. Saturday, I'd go to a game and commentate on it. So you develop that skill set at the same time as you're developing the skill set as a as a drive time presenter, and you know totally different aesthetics required. So um, it was just circumstances, really, more than anything else. Just okay, what's required here? Um, so adaptability was the name of the game. I had to be as adaptable as possible to, you know, um, to be to be useful to a radio station or useful to a company that they could, they could, they could put me in different situations. And when it came to talk sport, um, I've been there 17 years and there's only me and one other guy who've worked and presented at pretty much every time slot around the 24 hour clock in a seven day period. I've done breakfast, mid morning, afternoons, drive, evening shows, late night, overnights, weekend breakfast shows, Saturday afternoon commentary, Saturday evening phone-ins, the lot. The only show I haven't done is the fishing show, and that ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I can't blame you for that at all. I'm quite prepared to let that go. But <laughs> that, that's, that's why I try to be, you know, versatile and try to make myself as, you know, handy to various producers and, and bosses as I possibly could be. And I must have been doing all right because I kept getting these offers of work right around the right around the schedule, around the clock. Which is incredible. But going to the football commentary, right? We all know you're a massive Birmingham City fan. Does it hurt or break you in any way, shape? I know you can't really reveal that when you have to call Villa, Wolves, West Brom, Walsall, any of those teams <laughs> at all? <laughs> I actually adopted Warsaw as a bit of, I had got a bit of a soft spot for them because Warsaw were the first team I regularly covered when Tom Ross started drafting me in as a reporter 
and then a commentator. So my first beat was regularly to go and watch Walsall, who at that time were about to get promoted into what is now the championship. They were having one hell of a season under a, a chap called Ray Graydon, who used to play for Aston Villa. And that was a great education as well, because you were watching a team on the rise and the excitement that goes with it. Um, and even if I was just reporting it again in those early days, I was still doing what you would call off-air commentary. We have the rights to use, you know, goals, goal clips from off-air commentaries. Okay. So you, you learn commentary skills really quickly as well. Um, and I had my my commentary favourites when I was growing up, David Coleman and Barry Davis and, oh. you know, and people like that when I was growing up. So, you you, you know, you but you... you you still want to be yourself. You don't want to be a, a facsimile of somebody. You still have to be yourself. But, you know, you draw upon all the expertise that they brought to bear. Um, and yet before, before long, be, before you got to the mid-2000s, the comedy thing had completely disappeared. And my life centred around sport and commentaries and, um, and that side of things. Absolutely. Do you call any rivalry games? Did you call Villa Birmingham or West Brom Birmingham or anything like that? Never, never did a Villa Blues game, but um, I must have done a Blues West Brom game. I certainly did Blues Wolves a couple of times and Wolves Walsall. Um, and I had no problem commentating on Villa games. And, you know, again, that was all part of the, 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 the training. So you would go and commentate on a Villa game even if you just report again, you're doing a commentary on it, some of which might be used. And yeah, you you know you're broadcasting to a partisan audience of Villa fans. So I could have been childish and just gone, oh, you're Villa school. <laughs> <laughs> can't do it. It's unprofessional. So you learn pretty quickly. My opinion is utterly irrelevant. I've got to get the excitement across that Darius Vassell has just scored the winning goal at the Holt end in the last minute to beat West Ham, as happened, I think, very early on in my time um, doing those games. And you have to get that excitement across. And to do that, you've got to go Tonto. So I went Tonto. Did, is it just imagining the sharp has been like, so unclean? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I heard it once, I've heard it a million times. We put on Facebook, on, uh, off to Aston Villa tonight to commentate on blog. And the message was, wipe your feet on the way out, you know. All that. Yeah, I can imagine. Just uh, thinking I've never heard it before. But what, what it does is that when you spend a, a length of time doing commentaries, um, that tribalism that's kind of ingrained into you as a supporter when you're, it kind of dissipates a little. Mm. I still don't want Villa to win anything, you know. Um, <laughs> But I'm, it's not, I'm not obsessed with them not winning anything, you know? Yeah. What Where, you know, I'm desperate to go on Twitter if they've gone 2-0 down and just troll people. That really doesn't interest me. <coughs> the thing that blows my mind more than anything, okay, so, for example, let's take Arsenal Spurs. So, like, obviously, they don't, the fans do not like each other. But yet, Arsenal fans will cheer Harry Kane when he plays for England. Well, yeah, there's a suspension of disbelief there, isn't there? And, it, you know, it's try and get into the mind of a football fan. It's never straightforward that the psyche of a football fan and what they deem to be acceptable, you know. And mm. we're in this era at the moment with this disgusting racism oh, mm. through social media. Marcus Rashford had it last night. Absolutely deplorable what he has to go through. Um, and... Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be going away. Um, I, I, I despair, really. Um, those people are in a minority, but they're still there. And I, um, it it's, it's, makes me really sad that yeah. people feel that they have to do that, that it gives them... I don't know what it gives them. I don't know what inspires them to be as disgusting as they are but they still do it and I will never understand it. No. No, same. It's when uh, all the Millwall fans booed when they, they knelt for BLM and stuff. I mean, when that happened. 
you see, see, yeah, I mean, some clubs tried really hard. Millwall as a club have tried so hard over the years to work with the community and, you know, prevent, you know, the sort of incidents that you're talking about there. And let's be, every club's gotten. Oh, yeah. My club's gotten. My club had that complete lunatic that ran onto the pitch and tried to punch Jack Grealish yeah. a couple of years ago. Um, and that was sickening behaviour, indefensible. So every club has got them, um, whether it's one or two, 10 or 20, 300 or 400, you know? Um, nobody can take the moral high ground as a football supporter and start looking down their nose at a club because, you know what? There's someone wearing your team's colours who's just as bad as that person that you're sneering at. So we have to, somehow we have to find a united front to drive this awful, awful racism out of the game. Because I thought it, well, it was clearly never gone. It was certainly not as obvious as it was in the 80s where bananas were being thrown at black players like John Barnes. Um, but even that started to creep back in. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang had a banana skin thrown at him at an Arsenal game within the last 12 months. So it's still been there dormant and it seems something seems to have emboldened those racists. We could debate all that about what's done it and what's emboldened and what's, what the catalyst has been, but it's brought them back out into the open. I don't follow football at all. So what you two are just saying, that has blown my mind. I had no idea that sort of thing happened. It still does. That is shocking. Any any player from any black player who has a even a mediocre performance, Jamie, and maybe doesn't score or misses what a fan would perceive to be an open goal. Honestly, that the, the they put send Instagram messages with emojis that you know they know exactly what they're doing. Oh yeah, yeah. The emo- I don't need to. <laughs> and sometimes they don't even use emojis they just use the worst language possible and it's it's everywhere it's everywhere and I don't know how we stop it other than some way that social media companies can be forced to crack down on the instances that we see because it seems you know friends of mine get online abuse for different reasons and they report it to, you know, who they're meant to report it to on the social media platform they're on. And it gets short shrift. It just gets, you know, that this doesn't violate our terms. It fucking does. Do something. What are, you, what, what are, these, people, what are these companies waiting for? We've had Caroline Flack take her own life because of what social media did to her. And don't spare me the, oh, she brought it on herself. Bullshit. No. You know, it's it's really worrying that, you know, that, that there's a, a culture of bullying, racism, and then defence of that bullying and racism as though it's somehow acceptable. And there's a reason for it. It's, you know, I'm 52 years of age, you know, I've... <laughs> And I, I've never known it. Social media has just amplified the problem to a degree that um, obviously makes me realise it was always there. It just needed a vehicle to bring those horrible yeah. people out. What a shame. Yeah, oh, 100%. And I completely agree with everything you just said. It's, social media has basically given them their voice now. They're allowed to have their opinion. And it's just everywhere, all there for the world to see. And it shouldn't be happening. Freedom of speech is one thing. Uh, you know, consequences is quite another. What about the consequences of free speech? Uh, and too many people jump in feet first with their insults, claiming the free speech banner, not thinking for a nanosecond about the consequences of what they're doing. That's the problem. But to bring it back around, my next question was going to be about how you pay yourself for commentary for a football game. But 
like you were just saying then, like with fans running on the pitch and like hurling abuse, like, how do you learn how to deal with that? Do you just ignore it or do you address it? Um, if I'd been commentating that day when Jack Grealish was struck by the Birmingham fan that ran on the pitch, yeah, I'd have mentioned it. Mm. I'd, give, I'd have just, I'd have torn that guy, I'd, you know, get him arrested. You can't ignore things like that. Most of the time at football grounds, yes, there's bad language and, you know, you don't hear, I don't remember hearing racism that much. To lighten the tone slightly, I mean, you know, you, I was at a game once, um, this is years ago now, Millwall against West Bromwich Albion. It was an Easter Monday. And I can swear on this properly, can't I? Yes, yes of course. Can. Yes, yeah. Well, I've got to in this instance, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> the press box at Millwall in the main stand is quite close to where other supporters are. There's just a little wall uh, to the left of where you're sitting. And then beyond that, there's, I don't know, season ticket holders or regulars, whatever it may be. And um, myself and Tony Brown, Bomber Brown, the Albion's leading goal scorer in history, were doing this Millwall West Brom commentary. So I've got a headset mic on, right? Tony's got his headset mic on. And there's also, I've got uh, an effects microphone in another channel to pick up crowd noise. And about 10 minutes into the game, all you can hear is this guy, I can't see him, but I can hear him. He's about eight rows back, going, oh, don't give it to that fucking cunt. Oh, <laughs> don't give it that, that fucking cunt's useless. Fucking get that cunt off the fucking thing. <laughs> fucking shit, because I know my boss is listening to this, because it was the only game that day. So I've turned off that effects microphone thing, right? That, that should do it. So it's just my headset and Bomber's headset, right? Make a scrap of difference. Oh, oh you fucking useless cunt. <laughs> useless fucking cunt. Oh, it's all I'm here. So I've had to say, you know, during the it was the first instance, you hear it all the time on Sky Sports now, but I'm going, no, I do apologize if you've heard any um uh, foul and abusive language. Um we had another get that there was another game on that day that I could throw to for a report and be off air for 30 seconds. So there was a Warsaw game on. So I thought, right. The game's going on and I'm commentating and I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to have to tell this bloke. I can't, and I'm, turned, I'm, I'm concentrating on the game. I'm just going to have to tell him when I get the chance. So at one point, I've gone, right, here's the moment because the ball had gone out of play or somebody was injured so I could afford to go to the other game and get a report and we wouldn't miss anything. So I've said, okay, let's get across to the Bescott Stadium, get an update on Warsaw against Chesterfield, Ian Rivers. So Ian Rivers picks up at Warsaw and I whip the headphones off and turn around and go, excuse me, and I look, and he's fucking massive. Yeah, of course he is. <laughs> he's 20 stone. He's a day. He's got the love, hate, tattoo. <laughs> uh, ball, shave, and he's got the swallow tattoo on his neck. You know, I mean, just the, the, the worst I could have encountered. But, I thought, right, I've got to go through with this. So I've whipped the headphones off. Excuse me, mate. Um, I'm broadcasting back to an audience back in the Midlands, a family show, and your language has been picked up on our effects mobile phones. Would you mind, would you mind moderating your language, please? And what could he have done? He could have walked down six steps and just popped one on my face, couldn't he? Just knocked me out or, you know, stormed off or got a steward and got me thrown out. But his response was priceless. His response was, oh, sorry, mate. Oh, yeah, I really, I, I, I am so sorry. I didn't, I, I really am really desperately, desperately, you know, it's, it's not what I'm like, but, you know, I'm, I'm really desperately sorry. But he is a fucking cunt, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 yeah, yeah, he has turned back, put the headphones on, I'm ready to go back on air. And for the next 10 minutes, he was good as gold. Next and, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, because then the Millwall manager, whoever it was at the time, made a substitute he didn't agree with. Oh, don't bring that fucking cunt on. <laughs> and I just looked at Bomber and thought, couldn't have done any more. And that was that. So, you know, you just have to roll with the punches. But although 
Thankfully, in this case, it wasn't literally. That's incredible. I love that. that we, as we were talking earlier about your comedy and stuff like that on the radio, uh, I saw a reference to a parody song, uh, Des Lynam's Seven Days. <laughs> and it's saying it picked up national press notes, but I couldn't find any examples online or what. You'll find Could... it on the first episode of the Barmy Old Podcast, right? So if you if you go to iTunes or Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, and look for Ian Dancer's Barmy Old Podcast, you will find that parody song on episode one. That was because at the time Des Lynam was he was the big star. You know, he was the host of the Premiership, you know, the ITV match of the day you know, show. And um, we had this idea of him singing Craig David's Seven Days. I had feeling it was going to be Craig David's. <laughs> yeah, because it was kind of, he was the housewife's choice. <laughs> so we had this idea of him singing to uh, Unrequited Love. And we just changed the lyrics around a little bit. So it was on Monday, took her for a drink on Tuesday. We were making love by Wednesday and on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, chilled out on Sunday. Nasty rash on Monday, <laughs> clinic on the Tuesday, antibiotics on Wednesday and on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, chilled out, you know, cleared up on Sunday. <laughs> that got a bit of notoriety. Um, Chris Tarrant, who was doing Capital Breakfast in London, heard it and played it on his breakfast show. And the coup de gras was some months later, where BRMB always used to hold a thing called Party in the Park, where you get the pop acts of the day to come to, in this case, Alexandra Stadium in Perry Bar, and, you know, you, Billy Piper and Steps and whoever, um, to do two or three songs to 30,000 people, as it was. And the, it was the programme controller's bright idea for me to go on and sing as Des Lynham, doing seven days. Uh, that's about the most bizarre thing I have ever done in my entire life. <laughs> and it got a huge round of applause. I, it was just adulation um, for, you know, singing this Des Lynam parody song. That, so that song definitely had a life of its own. Uh, that's just one of a number of parody songs we did, but that's probably the one that the Barmy Brummies were, were best known for, singing it to 30,000 people as Des Lynam was odd. Did, did, Des, could... did Des ever say anything? I'm not sure whether Des was ever truly aware of it. The, the, the Sunday Sport ran a story on it. <laughs> I don't know whether Des buys the sport, so um, <laughs> he, may never, he may never have been aware of its existence. Aww. And I've never met the legend uh, to, to finally find out the truth. He's He's probably long since forgotten whether he'd heard it or not. But um, no, he, he certainly, I don't think he'd heard it at the time. But Chris Tarrant definitely played it on Capital Breakfast Show in London a few times. That is so, phenomenal. So the only thing that could have made that part in the park bit a bit any weirder is if they'd just gone, and ladies and gentlemen, Craig David, and just comes out and sings it with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably more expecting Avid Marion uh, or, you know, Bo Selective. Oh, that would have been amazing. <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that would have been more likely... <laughs> real freight, David. Yeah, that, that, no, thanks, Jamie. It was bizarre enough, thanks, without uh, <laughs> down even stranger path. Could you think of any of the other parody songs you did over the years? I'm just intrigued now. Oh man, um, loads. Oh, thank you. I mean, where do, where do you want to start? I mean, um, one that made me laugh, um, definitely made me laugh. We we, we had this, there was a story that a centre parks um, had had a, an accidental fire. Nobody was injured, right? Let's get this out there. Nobody was hurt. There was just a, a blaze in one of those sort of thatched rooms things mm. at a centre parks. I think it might have been the one at Longleat. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So Sean and I, the next day, we'd seen these headlines. And we checked to make sure there were no injuries. Nobody was there. It was just a blaze that they had to put it out and everything, you know, fire engines and whatnot. And Sean said to me, I've got an idea. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, um, "You because we had, a, we had a, a keyboard and a guitar 
ready in our spare studio to record a parody song on the fly. Because it had a drum machine on it. And I could like bounce tracks. I'd, I'd play a drum part first and then a bass part and then add guitar on and maybe keyboards if it needed a piano part. So he wrote a version of Part Life by Blur. <laughs> and instead of Part Life, it was Park Fire. Um, and that's a sent to Park Fire. You know, <laughs> it's like I wake up what I want. I wake up when I want. Except when I was rudely awakened by a raging inferno, sent to Park Fire. Uh, <laughs> and that, I, 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 got, I, I remember, I... What used to happen, I would be putting these parody songs together in the spare studio at BRB, which was directly next door to the on air studio. And Tammy Gooding, who was the presenter on before me, she had a button on her console where she could press it and she could hear what I was doing in that next door studio. Now she could see me singing away into this microphone and she's, what is he doing? What's he up to now? You know, what's he doing today? So she, and I was just finishing off. Sent to Park Fire, you know, all the people, they all go, ah! <laughs> <laughs> And she collapsed in a fit of giggles at what I was doing. She said, you can't do that. I said, everyone's fine. No one's, it's just, you know, no one's got injured. So, yeah, that, that was a song I was particularly fond <laughs> of, I think. And we did, we also did one that got us in a bit of trouble. Um, Olympics 2004 we were at Heart FM by this time and I, I seem to remember Team GB swimmers had gone to this Olympics don't ask me where it was this Olympics but anyway they'd gone there with a big reputation to get lots of medals and they only got out of all the competitions they entered no gold no silver just a couple of third places and um, Sean, and, Sean and I got together and we did a, by this time I was able to record stuff at home because it was a weekly show. So I had more time to be intricate with arrangements. And we did, um, you'll find this on the Barmy Old podcast as well, but two or three episodes in, same as Park Fire. We did a version of Spandau Ballet's Gold, <laughs> but we just called it Bronze. <laughs> just to highlight the fact that we haven't been as good as we thought we were. And we got complaints, you know, how dare you denigrate uh, the GB swimming team and run down their achievements. And we're thinking, hang on, we were told they were going to win 10 gold or whatnot, you know, they've ended up with two third places. We're just merely reflecting what's actually happened. So. <laughs> it's just a bit of fun. It's not like it's anything serious or detrimental anyway, just a bit of a laugh. We weren't, we weren't libeling anybody. We weren't insulting. We were just yeah. saying, you know, you got two bronze, bronze. <laughs> so, and that was that meant that, that that was a lot of arranging. For the, that's one of the most complicated songs I've ever had to write a <coughs> track for because I couldn't use karaoke tracks. Didn't really exist in those days that we could use. So I actually had to compose it, you know, to the arrangement we had, and learn the piano part and, and things like that. That was mental. So, yeah, there's there's a few that I'm I'm proud of. Like those that's, two. A, that's amazing. Yeah. Right, I, I wanted to bring it back to music because um, in 2013 you released your first solo album, uh, Preview Wrong, which is great, by the way. I especially liked Brilliant. Oh, thank uh, you. What was it that made you decide, you know, I'm, I'm going to write and record my own album? And by the way, listeners, if my research is correct, you played all the instruments and vocals on this album. Um, I played all the instruments and did some of the vocals. Um, Lee Small from uh, Shine Phenomena did most of the lead vocals on my first album. When it came to the second album, a couple of years later, that was all me. But Prove You Wrong was the outgrowing of um, a very sad time. Um, I've become friends with um, the, the band Shy, who were a kind of a British sort of Bon Jovi type band. I remember Shy. Yeah. Some good success in the 80s and whatnot. But. Um, in um, 2011, if I've got my timings right, uh, Steve Harris, the guitar player, passed away, a uh, brain tumour. He was able to put uh, Shy's last album together whilst he was, his condition was 
deteriorating, knowing that, you know, he was on borrowed time and he had to get this album finished. And it was at his funeral when I was just chatting to the producer of that last album. And he was talking about Steve's desire. Well, you know, he, he felt anything could happen. He, he might not make the next day. So he felt he just had to get these songs down on tape and, you know, get the things out of his head and onto a reel of tape and get them out there. And I just had a light bulb moment at that point and thought, well, I've got all these songs that I've never properly recorded. If I've ever recorded a song with a band, it's been demoed in like one day, like a rush job sort of thing. So let's do this properly. So that's that was the the, the seed of of prove you wrong, where it was about half and half, half songs that I'd always wanted to record from my old days that I'd never done, and some brand new stuff, like the opening track you hear, Soulmate, on Prove You Wrong. That was a brand new song that I'd written that year for when it came out. It came out in 2013, but that was all recorded during 2012 in Birmingham. So yeah, it was just an itch I had to scratch really. Like I said, it's it's really, really, really good. <laughs> well, you know, it was it was a labour of love, and it, um, getting I, I wasn't confident in myself as a lead vocalist at that time, which is why Lee was brought in to sing the vocals that he did. Um, but by the time he got round to the second album that I started recording the year after, and that was released in 2015, second time around, I was much more confident in myself as a as a lead vocalist. So. 99% of that album, save for a, a couple of bits of backing vocals done by a good friend of mine, Jane Gould, that was all me when it came to that second record, which I think is better than the first, but that's a matter of opinion. Was it tough to put all your focus into like doing this album, especially with like no bandmates and not to bounce ideas off? And also keeping in mind this time you're working for talk sports, so you're going to be busy as hell doing that as well. You pick your time and your place to go in and, and record. Um, I all the drums got done in three days. I initially had three days booked at the start of the sessions. And I got all, what was it, 15 tracks done. Um, uh, and then, you know, I just booked a couple of days here and there during the course of 2012. You know, it's about eight or nine months probably, sporadically going back in and adding bass parts or guitar parts, <laughs> vocals or backing vocals or mixing, whatever it was. But you know, there was a there was a certain degree of discipline because of course you start with the drums, and I'm not playing to anybody. There's no there's not anybody in the control room playing the guy guitar, so I'm playing the drum parts from memory, the arrangement. So wow. you, so you you start with that, and you make sure that you've got the arrangement exactly right, and the fills are in the right place, you know, and then you put the bass on top, and then you know it, you just build it gradually and gradually piecemeal um but you've got to have that discipline at first with the drum parts because as we mentioned earlier if the drums aren't right then everything else that sits on top of it isn't going to sound right either yeah, that's yeah. I, I admire the fact that you have that patience because me I, I know if i had done like the drum tracks were like well i need to do the guitar tracks now i'm not waiting four weeks before i can get the studio again i need to do it fucking now yeah. well <laughs> I've got a good ear. I, I discovered when I was a kid that I had something called perfect pitch, which is where, you know, you can play a note like, oh, that's an, you know, an E or that's an, an A or a G. So I've got that. It's like some people see colours. I can see notes or hear them, you know, and that was a big help to me as a songwriter and as an arranger and also trusting my instincts for what I thought might sound good. Because, you know, with a song like Soulmate, the first song you hear on Prove You Wrong, there's a twin lead guitar thing that's kind of one of the hooks, one of the motifs of the song. And I didn't have that in mind. I had just a single guitar line. But the producer said, that would sound really good if you put a harmony part on top of that. So straight away on the fly, you're thinking, oh, God, right, OK. So if that's in that key, what works with that? And you're under pressure. You've got to find something, pull something out of the bag that works. And when it does work as I believe it did in that instance, it just makes you feel, you know, 10 feet tall that you've, you've pulled that out. It sounds as good as it does. Do you, mean, do you have any time to just live? <laughs> to actually do anything other than, you know, working or well, music? This week's, this week's been fairly quiet. I mean, I am, at the moment, this, this room is doubling up as a, 
as a studio to record guitar parts for album number three, which is um, in the middle of being done, I would say. It's not finished by any stretch. Amazing. Um, there's going to be another solo album at some point, if not this year, then early next. Um, but, you know, people think I'm working seven days a week and I'm not really, you know, it's, yes, Saturdays I'm, I'm at football matches or whatnot and, you know, Sometimes planet rock shifts occur working for them, which I do now. Um, but no two weeks are ever the same. That's probably the best way to describe it with my life. Some weeks are very quiet. Some weeks are mad busy. Well, I mean, the football season's finishing. Well, it's finishing on Monday, isn't yeah, it? I've, the... got game. I've got my last game for this domestic season on Monday for the playoff final between Morecambe and Newport. And then I've got a couple of weeks off and then the Euros kicks in. And I'll be doing some commentaries for Talk Sport for the Euros. Oh, amazing. Excited? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I won't be doing England games. I'll be doing, um, I think I'm doing the three German group stage games against France, Portugal and Hungary. Oh, what a group that is. Oh, absolutely. A group of death, uh, as they call it. So that's, that's going to be my responsibility once we get to kind of mid-June. Um, I'm just so excited. 23 years it's been since Scotland have last been in a world tournament. And I'm just, I know it's not one, I know it's the Euros, but still, just, we're still there. I don't care if we get destroyed every game. We're just going to be there. I'm just going to get drunk. <laughs> it's just going to be a wonderful experience. If we get any further in the group stages, bonus. Absolute bonus. Absolutely. Just embrace it for what it is uh, and and see what happens. You know, you won't be the only, only country thinking like that. There'll be countries like Finland that have, don't think have ever played at a major tournament finals before for it. It's all brand new for them, you know, and it's all brand new for your generation of Scotland fans because France 98 was the last one. So, you know, yep. it's all brand new for you too. But, yeah, great. I remember we took Brazil to the limit. I think we won a lot with like five minutes to go. If I'm thinking, well, the, the Brazil game I'm thinking of was 1982 when you had the audacity to score a 30 yarder in the 10th minute and they ended up thrashing you 4 1 because you. <laughs> You kicked the hornet's nest of Brazilian football far too early in that game. <laughs> went and you. I'll never forget that James McFadden goal against France. Oh, oh. Yeah. well, McFadden was a bit, a, a bit of a Birmingham City star as well. He was a very important player for for my team. So when he scored that goal against the French, there was a you know Birmingham fans had that sort of you know feeling of kinship. Should we say? Yes. It was beautiful. Sorry to completely go off track. I'm just looking forward to the Euros. Are we all? So you mentioned briefly then about uh, Planet Rock. What is it you're doing at Planet Rock? I'm just the cover guy. Um, because Paul Anthony and Wyatt and Darren Reddick, they're the three main presenters on Planet Rock during the day from, you know, six in the morning till seven in the evening. And sometimes they need time off. And... I was approached in 2015, I think, to cover for those guys if ever they took time off. Um, and that's what I do. So next week, I'll be from Tuesday to Friday. I'm looking after Darren's afternoon show between two and seven. Um, so another string to the bow, I guess you could call it. <laughs> another little aspect of my, um, my strange little life. As a music lover, though, that must be ace to do with like a channel like Planet Rock because you just get to listen to your favourite songs all day. Exactly that. It is exactly that. Uh, and what it also does, as I've mentioned before in other interviews I've done, is how it it opens your mind to other bands that you you know you you haven't really listened to enough of other mm. artists uh, who are on the playlist and you get to appreciate just how good they are. Uh, when you listen to a band like Tom Petty, The Heartbreakers. And you hear like "Here Comes My Girl" and "The Waiting" uh, and and songs like that. I think, God, this guy was brilliant. You know, of course, sadly lost to us a couple of years back now. Tom Petty. You know, it wasn't just about the stuff he did with Jeff Lynne, like "Running Down a Dream" or "I Won't Back Down." You, the, the, the damn the torpedo stuff in the early Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers is just brilliant. What a band as well. You know, Mike Campbell, Ben Montench, Stan Lynch, great band, the Heartbreakers. So that's an education for me that 
you know, every day is a school day, as Wyatt often says. And it is a school day because you'll, whether it's a, an old artist, an old song that you haven't heard for years and it suddenly registers with you, or it's a new band that we're playing that sounds wicked, like those damn crows who I'm really into at the moment, who are a brilliant band from Bridgend. Mm. You still get that frisson of excitement, whether it's an old band or a new band that you're playing. This might sound like a really weird question, but for bands of old, does it ever, not I say frustrate might be the wrong word, but like knowing they'll never release anything ever again, is that not, is that, because I'm into more, I'm into the more modern stuff now. Like I like, I can appreciate some older bands and stuff like Guns, like I brought up on Guns N' Roses and that sort of thing. But I'm just thinking like, because Jamie's quite into like classical rock and stuff as well. Like knowing that bands will never bring out another record again. Does that ever be like, oh, I wish that you could just do one more. Well, the law of diminishing returns quite often kicks in with, you know, bands that keep, keep releasing albums. There's a few exceptions to that. I can think of a band like Cheap Trick who still release new music regularly and I still love what they do. Um, saw them supporting Def Leppard a couple of years ago in oh. and they were, I just love Cheap Trick, great melodic rock. You just can't knock it, you know. Um, I mean, Kiss have done some relatively recent new albums in the last decade or so. They had Sonic Boom that came out in 2009, I think, and then Monster yeah. a few later. And there's, there's one or two good songs on each, but not as consistent as an album I would love, like, say, Creatures of the Night or Alive, the, the album we started talking about right at the top of the show. Um, it, it depends on the band, really, to be honest with you, Tom. It's just dependent on how hungry that band is, mm. you know, or whether they just feel like they're going through the motions. Just I, think, album. I can't remember if it was Paul or Gene, I was listening to an interview and they went, the reason we don't want to record new albums is because we did Sonic Boom, we did Monster, not a single fan asks for those songs live. And that is what Kiss is, we're a live band. So what's the point? Yeah, there's an element of that. There's the element of, you know, at, at what point does a song like say, yeah, that's the last track on Sonic Boom. At what point do Kiss fans consider that a classic Kiss song? Because it is a great song, as I mentioned. It's a one great of the song, yeah. They played it on the last tour. Sonic Boom, along with Modern Day Delilah and um, maybe one other. But when does Say Yeah pass over from being a song on Sonic Boom to a classic Kiss song like Detroit Rock City or God of Thunder? It's a really tricky thing for the band to know. And they did put Stay Yet yeah into the last set list when they played it um, in Birmingham um, in 2019. So it came back into the set list nine, ten years after it had been originally on an album. And it went down really well. Mm. But I don't think it went down well enough for a, a Paul or a Gene to think, well, we need to make more. They don't. And they say nobody buys it. That they're, they're firmly in this camp of, you know, the streaming services have effectively made it not worthwhile releasing new music because it's just not profitable because everybody wants it for free. And there's a big part of it with a lot of the older bands as well is because like you say, it's not what they used to, the modern music markets. So no, the, the industry's completely changed, you know, from the 70s and 80s when it was record companies giving artists advance money to go and record albums and then that money would be recouped through album sales and touring and merchandise sales. All bands have got now is merchandise. And even that is being cut by venues who want a, they want a, a percentage of merchandise sold under their roof. So every avenue available to young bands to make money is gradually being cut off. And when Spotify pay 0.0001p per stream of a song, what good's that to an artist? What's that? What what encouragement is that supposed to be for an artist? So Adele can get hundreds of thousands of streams a day, as she does, and can barely go shopping at Sainsbury's with, with what she earns from it. <laughs> that's crazy. <coughs> so, and that's Adele, who's got a massive following, and people are streaming her songs all the time. So if you're a band like I mentioned, those damn crows earlier, you know. 
they've got to try and generate as much income as they can from, you know, touring and getting out there and trying to sell those damn crows hoodies and beanie hats and things like that. Because people will buy the albums and that's great. And, it, you know, you need that body of work that, out there that people can hear. But it's not generating anything like the profit for band that, that CD sales used to or album sales used to. Completely different world now. So before we start wrapping up, I, I wanted to mention like what you're doing now. So obviously you said that talk sport and you can find you on planet rock. Um, but I did see you also do an awesome looking band called lever and lace. Ah, yes. Now this is um, something that um, Gary, my former bandmate in dress to kill the bass player and I um, formed back in, let me get this right. 2014, we came to the original idea. Gary and I, that we wanted to put together um, a classic rock anthems theatre show. So you'd hear classic rock anthems and power ballad. Again, you know, a theatre show, two guitarists, two singers, bass, keyboards, drums, playing Toto, Foreigner, Journey, Survivor, REO Speedwagon, Def Leppard, Whitesnake, Bon Jovi, Van Halen, Aerosmith songs. Again, 100% accurate as they were meant to be heard and just give people that time capsule to go back to of the those hedonistic days of the 70s and 80s and put that as a theatre show with a proper theatre production. And uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And of course, we've not been able to go out there and play um, because of lockdown and everything, but champing at the bit to get back out there as soon as we possibly can. And so, I was hoping it comes soon. It's a great night. Again, it's, it's all about... You know, we've got a male singer and a female singer, and they just divvy up, you know, songs between them. Um, and we don't have anything on tape. We don't have any sort of, you know, backing tracks or anything to augment what we do. It's it's, all, it's us, warts and all. Um, and we all take great pride in its all of us. Great pride in its accuracy. So I saw a video on the um, on the website where you're wearing an amazing purple vest. May I add? Right. And Yes, waistcoat. Sorry, and it is. It sounds brilliant. the The female singer has got an amazing set of pipes on it. It's really good. That is Tanif. Tanif is our secret weapon um, because we'd rehearsed as a as a band without singers for about a year, just as the two guitars, bass, drums, keyboards, just to get the musical side of things right before we even considered auditioning any singers. And um, we had four or five male singers and four or five female singers come in to audition for us at the time. And one of the audition pieces for all the ladies was Alone by Heart. Mm. And there's a there's a particular scream that Anne Wilson does midway during that song. And all the singers did it and did it really well. All the singers that auditioned for us. No question, they were all great. But Tanith was just that extra 5% hairs on the back of the neck standing on end brilliant um and i knew from we were all casting sort of furtive glances amongst each other while she was thinking yep yeah, she's the one um Amazing. So, yeah she's um she's she's a brilliant brilliant singer and a lovely person to have around you know we're all nice nice people in leather and lace <laughs> we all get on <laughs> with each other and enjoy each other's company yeah, I really hope I could check that show out when you're uh, back up and on the road because well, it does look really good. We will be back. We're we we're, we're, um, we're getting together very soon for a for our first rehearsal. Now that we can do it uh, in a COVID secure environment, and we're very much looking forward to get back in the same room as each other once again. And yeah, soon we'll be back on a lighted stage somewhere. Incredible. Right, Tom. Before we start wrapping up, have you got any more questions? Yeah, um, I noticed that you were a presenter for Gems TV doing like some sort of shopping channel God, yeah. sort of esque. Yeah, I'm just intrigued to what made you dip your toe into that water. That was um, circumstances. When, when I left BRNB um, in 2002 as a drive time presenter, yeah, that was not what I wanted to happen, but BRNB's music policy changed and they wanted more songs and less talking so a show like mine was always going to suffer for that yeah but i was still working for them as a football commentator so i still have work at the weekends but i needed something to do in the week 
as it turned out, a big fan of the Barmy Brummies, Steve Bennett, had just set up um, a company in Redditch, just outside Birmingham, doing infomercials. And he was trying to set up a, a fledgling shopping channel, which started life as, it was known as Factory Outlet TV at first. Mm -hmm. I think in 2002, I did a, a screen test for them, got in. So you started doing pre-recorded infomercials on the strangest stuff, karaoke machines, <laughs> uh, pots and pans, you know, things like that. And it developed into a falling auction channel called Snatch It. Uh, and then Snatch It, which became popular and actually in many ways saved the company, the falling auction idea. It then morphed into Gems TV in about 2004 when Steve met a gem dealer from Thailand and he completely bought into the idea of us all being gem experts. So we all had a training course. We all went off to Thailand, all of us presenters to learn about, you know, where gems come from. We went to a sapphire mine just outside of um, uh, Bangkok. <laughs> and I became an expert on um, gemstones and jewellery. Um, and I stayed there probably for another two years doing that doing shifts during the week. So I'd be doing um, a football match on a Saturday, Art FM show on a Sunday. I then have Monday off. That was my day off, you know, in the week. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, typically during the day, I'll be doing shifts at Gems TV, selling wow. pens, necklaces and rings and earrings and all that with sapphires, rubies, emeralds, amethysts, tanzanite, you name it. That's incredible. We're doing all the hand motions to ready to be like a hand model at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it became a bit Bridget Jones, you know. Uh, <laughs> at any time, really occasion. <laughs> we did try and have some fun with it. We were allowed to put a leeway to be ourselves, you know, and not be stiff up a lip and, you know, with a rod up our ass. You know, we, we, <laughs> we were allowed to have a bit of fun with it, which we did. And, um, the, the viewers loved it and it came across to the viewers how much we loved it and they loved it too. And it's James TV is still going strong now in 2021. You'll find it on your, in the 600 somewhere on your Sky EPG. That's it's amazing. Still a lot of the same presenters who I was working with then back in the day are still there and they're still lovely people. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love, I that. love that. Ian Danter, musician, radio presenter, Gem expert. <laughs> yeah, don't put it on the business card. I'll have to stay off. Right, so Ian, before we let you go, we like to play a little game with our guests, if that's okay with you. We literally, we call it a quick fire round and we just fire five questions at you and you answer them as quick as you can. Okay. So first one, your first ever concert. Kiss 1983, Lick It Up Tour at Stafford Bingley Cowshed. Fuck, I'm so jealous right now. Um, supported by Helix and Heavy Petting. Um, Heavy Petting were the first band on, and after their first song, it was We Want Kiss. We want kiss. <laughs> they had the, the stage set with a tank. Mm. Uh, Eric, Eric Carr's drums were set up on the turret and gun of a tank. Vinnie Vincent was in the band. It was the first tour without makeup. But they just released it up. What I mean, what a first gig! I'm uh, so jealous right now. <laughs> And my mum and dad, me and my two mates, Andy and Tim, they drove us up to Stafford from Solihull to this gig. And mum and dad had booked a table for a meal in somewhere nearby, Utoxeter or something. And mum had said, meet us back here. We'll, we'll put the car back here when we pick you up. So, of course, they, they get back and find a, the spot where they said they'd meet us. And they can hear the last strains of Black Diamond or something coming out of this Stafford Bingley cow shed. And all of a sudden, the doors open, and this sea of denim and leather starts. <laughs> and she was going, "Where's my son?" You know, because uh, what she could see was these hordes of thousands of, it was like seven thousand people, I think, would have been in that place that night. Um, but yeah, that was uh, oh. October '83. Kiss, lick it up to her. Thank you very much. It's all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favourite pizza topping? Oh, uh, mighty meeting. Oh, good answer. Great show. The best impression you can do, in your opinion? 
Trevor Francis, the former Birmingham City player and manager, is the one I get thrown at me as being the one that others think are most is most accurate. So I'll probably go with that. And Trevor sort of sounds a bit like this. He comes from Plymouth. And he's got an accent where it sounds like he's got a slightly blocked up nose. Um, so, yeah, but is it, it doesn't get me much work. Um, you know, not much more affected a Gary Neville or a Jamie Carragher, but, um, you know. Oh. I Hello. love that. I knew the name, but I couldn't picture it. And as soon as you did that voice, I was like, yep, I know exactly who it is now. <laughs> he's, he's the one that people to me most, I think. Oh. Who would play you in the movie of your life? James May. I could see it. I could see it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent answer. And last but not least, a piece of advice you would give to your younger self. Just believe in yourself, for goodness sake. Um, have a bit of faith in your own abilities. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably what I would have said to myself. I like that. Don't, don't give up. Beautiful. I don't think, and I don't think I ever truly gave up on anything. Some things ran their course, but um, yeah, I'd have, I'd have said to myself, to "Keep going. You never know." Amazing, Ian. <laughs> this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for doing this for us. An absolute pleasure. Nice to speak to you guys. Uh, yeah, before thanks. you go, is there any plugs, any websites, social medias, etc.? Well, people can go to my website and, and learn more about me. There's uh, iandanta.co.uk and you can purchase my two albums on that website as well for um, Prove You Wrong and Second Time Around um, Yeah, if you want to hear those podcasts there's like 25-26 episodes all half an hour in length that you'll find on uh, Apple Podcasts or Audio Boom or wherever you get your podcasts it's called Ian Danta's Barmy Old Podcast um, and you know they're free to listen to and whatnot. not um, Hopefully you'll enjoy those. And uh, yeah, look out for Leather and Lace uh, coming to a theatre near you uh, as 2021 becomes 2022. Classic rock anthems and power ballad show. I'll be all over that. I'll be all over that. Yeah. So again, Ian, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Thanks, guys. All the best. Absolute pleasure. Take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks, chaps. Take care, sir.